by her victory against the Mail on Sunday. Megan sat in a Santa Barbara garden ready for an interview with Oprah Winfrey, which had been planned prior to the wedding. You know, she had been planning and plotting and scheming like a snake to get into that seat across from Oprah low these many years. Megan was now ready to shame her in-laws and assert her narrative against the Cambridges. This is just so petty to me. Can you even believe it? I mean, this would be trashy on every conceivable level. You know, like going and talking to a bunch of strangers about your in-laws and your annoying brother and sister. Nobody gives a rat's ass about your fight with your brother-in-law. Like literally no one cares. And yeah, yeah, you know, these people are famous and all that, but it's like, you're not ever telling anything that makes it seem like you're being honest about any of this because you are always the hero of your narrative. That makes it disingenuous. Now, if you really wanted to lie effectively, what you need to do is sprinkle in a few times when you were sort of in the wrong and that makes people want to trust you. But when you were always telling us how you were the victim, you did everything right, you were perfect, it makes people go, well, what are you covering for? But if you could say a few times and you're like, no, I just feel like I got really frustrated and I, and I spoke incorrectly to this person and I was so, um, I was so passionate and upset that I totally came off wrong. If she'd like d thrown in a couple of those, people would have been like, oh, she's really honest, you know? And she could have been telling lie after lie after lie after lie after lie. But if she can throw in just a few things would make her seem like she's being fair. Oh, she would probably still have us eating out of her hand. To some, this was a reject's revenge against the royal family who plotted to deny her destiny. Those who smeared her reputation in London with lies about the pre-wedding arguments and her bullying were in her sights. Life is about telling stories, right? Said Megan, telling stories through a truthful lens. There's that lens again. Through a truthful lens? What are you even talking about? Isn't there only just one way to tell a story? There's no lens you have to attach. If you're going to open your mouth to say something, it should be truthful. This is just such, Megan, just stop talking. If you don't have anything to say, just don't talk. Over the previous weeks, Megan's lines had been written, rewritten, and rehearsed. She knew precisely the moments that she would hesitate, draw in breath, touch a carefully poised strand of hair, betray her reluctance to deliver a withering condemnation of the royal family. Oh, I don't know if I should. And overcoming her hesitancy and bashfully reciting her obligation to tell the truth. I don't know. But okay, for the sake of transparency, I will. It's hard to talk about it. Because I'm so shy about really exposing anybody. I, kindness and compassion are just my core virtues. So this, this whole interview kind of goes against, you know, how I, I would normally operate. But... <sighs> I know I have to overcome that for, for the sake of truth. I have to sacrifice the way I would normally function in service of truth. And sometimes truth means I have to do the hard thing and expose some of the damaging toxicity that does exist in the royal family. The interview lasted three hours and 20 minutes. Harry would be included after about two hours. You know, let's... Let's drag him in, you know, at the end of this. What in the world? These two girls gabbing about him. I mean, he is this, the crux of the matter. She wouldn't even be here if it hadn't been for Harry. He should have been included, like, right up front and center at the beginning. It just shows what a pawn he is in all of this. During the shoot, Megan disclosed that she was expecting a girl. She made no reference to Prince Philip nearing the end of his life. The thing is, is that because she's not kind and compassionate by nature, in reality, she, she owns none of those virtues. It wouldn't have even occurred to her that in order to seem exceptionally genuine, she needed to say something about Prince Philip's uh, physical and de physical health and declining well-being. If she were at all kind of compassionate, that would have been at the forefront of her mind to say, we are, you know, we're wishing them well. We are so concerned for him, you know, but if she had any of that in the first place, they wouldn't have left. But I'm continually astounded by some of these very obvious things she could have done to further manipulate the people watching. That's why I say she's not good at this. She's only sophisticated up to a certain point, but beyond that, 
she has no idea how to properly get people on her side for an extended amount of time. She only knows how to say the right things that are going to get people in her good graces for today. But she's not thinking about tomorrow, fiddly D. I'll think about that tomorrow. Well, tomorrow, because you didn't think about it, tomorrow ain't coming for you the way you want it to. Oprah had a great time. Regardless of what to me seems like a massive failure, Oprah came out and said that it was the best interview she'd ever done. Did any of y'all watch that and go, well done, Oprah. You asked all the questions we wanted, you know? None of us were sitting there going, oh, this is somebody who is unbiased and he had to give us the true tale of what had gone on. Oprah's over there gasping, bulging eyes, can't believe what she's hearing. She's playing right into it. What a sycophant she looked like. It just disgusted. Anybody who watched that interview and thought that they were, you know, were hopeful of hearing the real story, you know, getting some hard hitting journalism. Uh, we, she failed us. This was the best interview she'd ever done. It's time for her to pack up her toys and go home. Because if this is the best she could do, then she has petered out as an interviewer. There was a shock in Buckingham Palace. The Sussex's failure to tell the palace in advance was deemed to be an insult. Of course they're underhanded. And of course it's an insult. But it was an insult born of cowardice. Officials feared the worst. Edward Young could now understand Harry's recent haste to persuade the Queen that the couple could do commercial deals, yet remain working in partial royals. Trust in Harry rapidly declined. So many people who really believed that Harry was just a unwilling participant in all of this like he just kind of got swept out in the tide but you know his heart was still loyal to the family still loyal to the royals but this really shattered anybody's idea that he wasn't 100% participating in all of this now like I said last time I think that Harry is in there is a percentage of him that is an unwilling participant in this I think he had no idea that it was going to get like this. I think that he did want to hurt his family a little bit. Like like any spoiled, rotten child wants to inflict pain because they don't know what else to do with themselves. And it seems like it might be kind of fun for a little bit. It's like a game. That's how I think Harry viewed going with Megan and, you know, Megan's desire to shake things up. I think he was attracted to that. Because he's not a very strong personality. So he wanted to link himself with one who was stronger than him. He liked the idea. It thrilled him to think about what, what could happen. But it's all gotten out of control. I don't think he's still happy with, with where things have landed. And you can see it on his face over and over and over again. Whenever he's with Megan, there's a strain on his face like of embarrassment. You know? I think that for a long time he thought that it might be hard now. I might be a little bit embarrassed now. You know, it's just... It's just different. It's just a different lifestyle, you know, but I am speaking my truth. And the reason I'm uncomfortable, that's shame other people are putting on me, but I don't need to feel ashamed of what I'm doing. This is all okay. It's just, I have to get used to this new normal. I have to get used to standing up for myself in this way. But it's not that I'm actually doing anything wrong. This is just other people's issue, but it's not mine. So I think there's a little bit in there where he, he's gotten swept up into something he doesn't want. But at any point, he's an adult male. He could assert his masculinity and say, I'm out of here. This is not for me. I am not doing this anymore. I made a colossal mistake. I'm going home. All right. Here, these are the divorce papers. I'm seeing a lawyer. I'm done with this. You know, and call her bluff because she doesn't think he's ever going to walk out the door. She's used and abused him all of these years. Because she doesn't think he has the strength to do it. She's probably right. I would love to see a version of this story where Harry rises up, finds some inner strength, you know, that we never knew he had. And then like, it's just like, peace out, lady. Okay, I'm over this. Figure it out on your own. I'd love to see that story. I pray to see that story. But I just think that Harry is too far deep. He, he, ha he lacks the backbone. He'll never be able to get out now. Of, of on his own I mean unless he decides to employ some help getting out of this I don't see how he's ever going to get out of it on his own but I do think that Harry wants to get out I just don't think he knows how and I think he's given in to all of his baser instincts so that what once may have been an oopsie I think I've gotten myself into something now that he's there he's just given over to it 
So I think that there was a window of time when people could legitimately feel sorry for him. That window of time has closed. He's in it now. He's, he has now decided that this is going to be his thing. He's going to go against his family. He's going to make a big deal about them. He's going to make them this terrible gang that it's been after him his whole life. And that, you know, so at this point, when the Oprah interview came out, the window had closed. This is who he really was now. So all those people still hoping that, oh, he, oops, he, I think he made a mistake. He's really kind hearted. You know, remember he, he likes little kids. All the people who still thought that suddenly realized we've lost him. He's not coming back. He's in it now. He's embracing this now. And we may never see the Harry that we once loved. Young recommended retaliation. The queen decided that the Sussexes should resign the remaining royal patronages. Harry's last military titles and his patronage of the Rugby Football Union and Commonwealth Trust were stripped. Since he was born a prince, he kept his title. Meghan lost her patronage at the National Theatre and the Association of Commonwealth Universities, yet she could also keep her royal title. All that remained was to negotiate an agreement statement. Fraught and unsuccessful, the palace unilaterally announced, In stepping away from the work of the royal family, it is not possible to continue with the responsibilities and duties that come with a life of public service. But of course, the Sussexes shot right back. They weren't going to be told that they were incapable of living a life of service. And they said, we can all live a life of service. Service is universal. The Sussexes response drafted by Meghan's advisors appeared just as 99-year-old Prince Philip re-entered the hospital. What in the world is this? You needed an advisor to draft this statement. We can all live a life of service. Service is universal. That took a staff to write that. Oh. Amid the turbulent emotions, not least Prince Philip's inevitably imminent death, there was danger about the Sussex's behavior. Someone decided to launch a preemptive retaliation. The popular suspect, without any evidence, was Prince William. Some would say the information was delivered to the editor of the Times, while Valentine Lowe, the newspaper's royal expert, described his report as the product of several weeks of hard work. Either way, the result was striking. All right, so this is what happened. Just as Meghan's interview with Oprah was about to come out, the memorandum was taken to the, the Times. The memorandum that Jason Knopf had written about all of the staff that were in peril because of Meghan's behavior, traumatized by the things that she was doing and saying and the way she was behaving and treating them. So the Times revealed that Jason Kanov had reported allegations of Meghan's bullying to a senior official at Kensington Palace on March 3rd. This is when this came out. The newspaper's unnamed source also claimed that Meghan's behavior had compelled two personal assistants to resign and a third suffering a loss of self-confidence to say, I can't stop shaking. None of the four involved were identified. All claimed that they had been operating in a climate of fear where employees were routinely humiliated by both Meghan and Harry in front of their peers and repeatedly subjected to unreasonable demands. One aide told the Times it felt more like emotional cruelty and manipulation, which I guess could also be called bullying. Valentine Lowe wrote that he had been approached by sources who felt that only a partial version had emerged of Meghan's two years as a working member of the royal family, and they wished to tell their side. Traumatized and broken by the Sussexes' behavior, the officials objected to the palace's mismanagement of their complaints. To protect Meghan, the palace had refused to investigate the allegations. All the men in gray suits who she hates have a lot to answer for because they did nothing to protect people. These are some pretty damning allegations coming out, you know? And not just towards Meghan, but towards everybody involved who protected Meghan. This coming out right before that interview also made people realize that Harry might not be the poor victim of Meghan's manipulation that some people had initially wanted to believe because the report said that it wasn't just Megan bullying the staff it was Harry as well not at her behest but of his own volition encouraging this kind of behavior sticking up for Megan when she acted like this he was fine with it so this also sort of tore down the veil that poor little Harry walking behind his mother's carriage just got befuddled and confused those concerned, reported Rebecca English later in the Daily Mail, are fed up with the sheer hypocrisy of it all. The suggestion that they, the Sussexes, were being bullied and forced out when others were experiencing that very treatment at their hands was obnoxious and abhorrent. Meghan's lawyers had one week's advance notice of the Times allegations. Buckingham Palace was asked for evidence, documents, texts, and emails of her bullying. 
In the end, the Sussex's representatives could produce no legal grounds to prevent publication. Megan's response had been prepared. Let's just call this what it is, said Megan. A calculated smear campaign based on misleading and harmful information. Well, misleading and harmful misinformation, you say, Megan. Is that so? Is that why you didn't bother to sue the Times? When it came to the mail on Sunday, you couldn't wait to get your lawyers rallied around that cause. That shoddy little case that should never have come to court at all because it was just so ridiculous. Uh, but you got lucky on that one. This paper, The Times, having just seen all the litigation that went down surrounding the mail on Sunday, the fact that they would be willing to print a story about your bullying means the story must be true because they know who you are, how you deal, and the fact that you can win court cases in court when that you should never have won in the first place. Yet they seem to have such hard evidence behind this article that they aren't afraid of you or your lawyers. So that that's all I need to know. That this article should come out right after she won that court case. It would, I mean, it would appear that papers would be afraid to write about Megan in any negative way after that. But the evidence must have been so airtight that they felt no fear. Her lawyers lamented that the newspaper was used by Buckingham Palace to peddle a wholly false narrative. They said, we're disappointed to see this defamatory portrayal of the Duchess of Sussex given credibility by a media outlet. The Duchess, the lawyers added, was saddened by this latest attack on her character, particularly as someone who has been a target of bullying herself and is deeply committed to supporting those who have experienced pain and trauma. Um, did you hear what I heard? I didn't hear an outright denial of the facts. It's all, I'm disappointed to hear that you would say that. But that is not, I didn't do that. What are you talking about? I've never in my life acted like that. You know, it's all like, hmm, it's really disappointing that you'd come to these conclusions and that you would say these things about my character. I'm really disappointed to hear that. That's not a denial. That is not a denial. And her lawyers very carefully crafted that statement so that it wouldn't be. The Sussexes interpreted the newspaper report as yet another malicious attack by the palace on themselves, the innocent victims. Harry and Meghan had no doubt that the leak was instigated by William to sabotage their big moment, a preemptive strike before their big interview. Since Jason Knopf had written the memorandum, either he or his superiors had leaked it to the Times. The Sussexes knew that the palace could not be given the right of reply or even invited to comment about their harmful allegations against the royal family to Oprah Winfrey. But that, in their opinion, was different. They were speaking the truth. And Knopf's memo was utterly false. The, the real problem, this is their real anger in all of this, is that the Oprah interview was filmed in February. All this stuff came out in March. So they don't have a chance to rebut this bit to Oprah. It's already done. It's filmed. What they said is what they said. They wouldn't be mad about the fact that the palace came out and said any of this about them because this just furthers their narrative. Now they get to say, look, look, they're coming after us. See, see? But the real problem is that they didn't get to use this in the Oprah interview. That's why they're so mad. Whatever the motive, the character assassination of the Sussex is misfired. This is disappointing, but true. Uh, nobody really grabbed a hold of those bullying rumors like we should have. We should have taken those rumors by both hands and sat them down and said, tell me everything you know. Delivered without sufficient evidence, many readers sense the newspaper's source lacked conviction. The palace's caution suggested that Edward Young was fretting about whether the palace could accuse Meghan of bullying because they've got Prince Andrew that they're protecting. Belatedly, the palace hired a new firm of solicitors to investigate the bullying allegations, but hinted that only after an exhaustive process might the lawyers ask the Sussexes to answer the allegations. Sensing that weakness, which is blood in the water for Meghan, her communication staff orchestrated a wave of sympathetic statements by her friends against the palace. Ugh, we gotta trot out all our friends to say all the things about us that are so nice and glowing. You guys, when have you ever in your entire life had somebody say something that was vaguely unkind? That you then decided to trot out five, six, or seven of your friends on Facebook and be like, can you guys write statements about how awesome I am? I need to get a new narrative out there. So if you guys can just randomly post a bunch of really nice things about me, that would be great because somebody over there said something mean. This is not normal behavior. This is not the kind of thing that humans do. 
if somebody says something mean about you, you don't, you don't then usher seven of your friends to come out and say kind things about you. I'm really going to skim over this. Who cares what her friend said? Of course, somebody from her days at the suits, John Cowan, a script writer, comes out and says, the Duchess of Sussex is a really nice, kind, warm person. So there's this woman named Kristen Meinzer. She's like a writer and a friend or something. And she came out and had this sad little statement uh, that she tried to pull together. And let me just say, if these are the remarks of your saviors, heaven help you. Okay, listen to what Kristen had to tell us. No one has ever had this level of racism and misogyny and victorial leveled against them. Meisner blamed the inbred, messed up, dysfunctional family who were up against a highly educated, self-made millionaire who knew how to do the PR game. A lot of people think you guys were lucky to get her and you blew it. You guys are stupid faces. Uh, there was a U.S. T television producer, um, remember her friend Lindsay Roth, she came out and she told us that Megan has kindness and goodwill running in her bones. Is that the phrase? T to have something run in your bones? Interesting. Patrick J. Adams came out, you know, flapping his gums about how the royal family had bullied her and, you know, said that this knew his chapter and its timing uh, about Megan's bullying is just another stunning example of the shamelessness of an institution that has outlived its relevance. Blah, 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 blah. Let me just say all the words that I've heard other people say. I don't have any thoughts of my own. He said, my friend Megan is way out of your league, royal family. Oh, well, since Patrick J. Adams said it. Jessica Mulroney, famous for calling Megan's critics racist bullies, uh, who at this moment actually was being canceled because people said that Jessica was racist. Um, she came out swinging, saying that Megan, uh, was just nothing but kindness, empathy, and love itself. What I think is interesting is that Jessica has been forced to come to Megan's aid, aid time and time again, but when Jessica was in the throes of being canceled because people said she was racist, um, did we ever see Megan come out in Jessica's defense? I, I, I never saw that. Now, <laughs> admittedly, how much have I actually seen? The number of times I'm like, have you guys ever heard of this? And everyone's like, yeah, we already know that. But I, I could not find any time when Megan has gone out of her way to stand up for friends of hers who are in the crosshairs because she wants everybody else to come to her defense, but she's never willing to give of herself for anybody else. What's interesting is everybody did the same thing that the lawyers had done by saying, we're so disappointed that the palace would say this. We're so disappointed that this is the color they want to paint Megan with. We're so disappointed, blah, blah, blah. But none of them, none of her supporters came out and said, said the palace four are lying about what Megan did. They all just said, oh, well, the royal family's irrelevant anyway. You shouldn't listen to them. Oh, it's so disappointing that they would do this. Oh, Megan's faced so much bullying and misogyny. But none of them said, this is an outright lie. Megan would never do this. This is so, f they all said Megan has a loving spirit, but none of them said, this, this is categorically untrue. They are lying. This is falseness. Because everyone knew they couldn't say that. Tom Bauer reasserts this message by saying that none of her defenders had directly accused the palace for of lying about the alleged bullying. Megan's lawyers did not issue a claim for defamation against the Times. In Canada, the Reitman's crew recognized the truth. They all remembered that Megan really was like this. To promote Sunday's program, CBS broadcast a clip of Megan on Friday, uh, March 5th. Perfectly poised, Megan sat in a Montecito garden, a wisp of hair hanging down on her cheek, an excellent prop for her to touch while confessing her anguish and anger. For the trailer, she disclosed that she had been banned by the palace from giving Oprah an interview in 2018. But now liberated, she was able to just make a choice of your own and to be able to speak for yourself. Isn't that weird how she, the, the, the pronouns she uses sometimes, like she's, I'm able to, you're able to speak for yourself you make a choice of your own, like, but you're talking about you as, a, like, you personally, like, what, I don't understand why Megan always tries to use this kind of language that, well, I do understand why she does it. She does it because she's trying to include you and to draw you into her emotions, so she's saying you when she means me because she's trying to make us all see her side of things, but that's a really clunky way to manipulate people because 
if I don't have that experience, I'm not going to be drawn in by what you're saying. But what Megan should have done repeatedly, and I'll, I will never stop saying this, is if she really wanted people on her side, she would have confessed just a little bit to not being perfect. Some viewers did not spot genuine sadness in her eyes. Nobody spotted genuine sadness in her eyes. Her forced look of, um, like, she's, I'm just this little wounded bird. Stop attacking me. You know, that whole thing was so pathetic. It's like the other day when I was editing the last episode and I was looking for pictures of them when they went to go lay those wreaths down um, at that National Cemetery for Remembrance Day. And I was busting up laughing at the pictures I found. I, I had not seen those. And they are just so woebegone and just like. Like so forcedly sad, like <laughs> the graves of the fallen, the veterans, like they're just so fake about their sadness. All of those pictures. I mean, I've never seen any, like the, the acting in those photos is so like ninth grade acting. And the same thing was happening in that Oprah interview. Just like the forced sad eyes and the biting of the lip is well it was just so hard it was it was just so hard just some of the worst acting you've ever seen at cbs headquarters in los angeles there was excitement reduced to 85 minutes can you imagine what the other you know i mean there was three hours and 20 minutes they filmed and it was only 85 minutes we got to see i wonder what the rest of it was oprah winfrey had hit a gold mine ITV in London had paid about $1 million for the broadcasting rights. And like CBS, ITV was demanding premium rates for advertisements. Everybody wanted a piece of the Markle Pie. On the eve of the broadcast, the Sussex's spokesperson announced that their interview would be the last word about their rift with the royal family. Having needed to have their say, they now considered the matter closed and wanted to, quote, move on. <laughs> if flippant only. This is the thing. How could they move on? Because now the palace has, you know done them dirty and come out with this bullying accusation of course this wasn't going to be the last word they had you know and uh, you know they they only said that because they wanted to look like they were big and noble and we've said our piece and so now we don't have to say any more come on megan you could have never said another word about it and gone on your merry way as soon as your feet hit the american shores you know that was the whole thing we just want to go and live our life well then do it you know, you don't need a spokesperson to come out and be like, no, we're not going to say anything else, okay? We've said our piece. We're not going to say anything else. Just don't say anything else. How about that idea? That sentiment was grasped by Buckingham Palace's spokesperson. On Saturday night, he predicted that the interview would be quickly forgotten sideshow, lost in the mists of time. See, this is what I'm saying. The palace had no idea what environment that they were functioning in. And this is, I'm like, do you guys have anybody, like, working for you guys that are, um kind of just like have their finger on the pulse of the cultural moment. I don't mean to say this in like a, a, a like a mean way whatsoever. I know they've got like young people working there. But are you guys listening to what those young people are telling you what's going on? Because I feel like if they had gotten some people up in there to be like, hey, this isn't the days of like, you know, mainstream media, and you've only got like a couple of channels on TV. And like, that's the source of people's information. Okay, like we need, they need people up in there who's like, okay, this is what everyone's talking about right now. This is how we're going to respond to this by being informed by what is happening in the culture. I sometimes just feel like the palace is just like a little bit behind. Like, I feel like they're still responding to things like this is 1998. It ain't. Okay, you've got to be a little bit faster on the uptake here. News moves quickly. And yes, I know that usually m many times stories are like, oh, it's, you know, here today, gone tomorrow. I don't really have to worry about necessarily this bad story that's come up. Everyone will forget it in the news cycle. Yeah, a lot of times they will. But not if the conversation is about something that everyone is talking about. And everyone at that time was talking about racial unrest. Megan's coming out saying they, they were racist against me. Megan's coming out saying because I was biracial, I wasn't invited into the royal family. Because I was an American and a divorcee, I was looked at then, you know, less than nothing. And because the conversation that was going on was about victimhood and Megan's coming out 
feeding that narrative in a, in a huge way saying, yes, and I was a victim of the royal family, a narrative that people kind of already believe that the royal family picks off the weaker ones and bullies the weaker ones because people wanted to believe that's what happened with Diana. Megan only has to come out and be like, I got more inside information about what bullies those people really are. In that climate, this story was going to be explosive. It wasn't just going to be lost in the midst of time. Come on. And that's what I'm saying. Like, was there nobody on, in, in the palace staff that was like, well, actually, I kind of think we need to consider what Megan is saying uh, and consider all the megaphones that are going to be screaming this story out because people want to believe that this is what's happening. People are, are such rageaholics right now that they want to continue to be outraged about this topic. Megan is giving these people the drug they're asking for. So we need to come out and we need to have some kind of plan. Now everyone's going to be high on this bit of outrage. What are we going to do? How are we going to actually deal with this? And what are we going to do to kind of like be the buzzkill to this whole thing? How are we going to help people come back to their senses? But there doesn't appear to have been anybody in the palace who was saying, do you understand the culture, the cultural moment that Megan is making these points in? Okay, well, Edward Young, again, failed to anticipate the sensational radio and TV headlines that would dominate the waking hours on Monday, 8th March. With his passive approach, Young also did not foresee the onslaught from America. Naively, Young believed that the interview would be the Sussex's last word. Was he just introduced to Meghan and Harry? How would this ever be their last word? On Saturday night in Montecito, Meghan was in bed crying. Not because she felt any remorse for her shattering allegations against the royal family, but because the firm had orchestrated a smear about her bullying. I held her, and she just cried and cried and cried. And here we were. I mean, all we'd done is speak the truth in the most compassionate and truthful way we knew how to do. We hadn't done anything wrong. All we did was tell the other side of the story, and of course the men in grey suits came down on my wife with a hatchet. This business about her bullying, have you ever known Megan to be anything but genuine, kind, sincere and loving? She saved me from the demons of the royal family. She's my saviour. Jesus Christ himself could never have been as wonderful as she was to me. And now... They want to blind her. Can you believe it? As she cried, Megan might have recalled telling the Fortune magazine audience five months earlier that if you live knowing the truth, regardless of what anyone says, you'll be able to go to sleep with a clear conscience. At the same time, she'd probably also forgotten uh, informing the same audience of this little bit of uh, advice. If you listen to what I actually say, it's not controversial. That night, Meghan and Harry apparently believed that their interview with Oprah Winfrey was true and not controversial. What ended up inflammatory is people's interpretation of what I say. They just choose to misunderstand what I'm saying. Nothing I have ever said is controversial. Saying that the people in the palace were racist against me and the color of my baby's skin, that's not controversial. Calling somebody a vicious misogynist, that's not controversial. That's just the truth. And if people can't live by the truth, that's their problem, not mine. In Harry and Meghan's opinion, they were victims of the racist tabloids. And now Buckingham Palace was stoking hatred about fictitious bullying. That's the end of that chapter.